but I do think that uh, overall the models are are um, they're not there, and I kind of feel like the industry it's it's um, it's over it's it's making too big of a jump, mm. and it's trying to pretend like this is amazing, and it's not. It's slop. And I think they're not coming to terms with it, and maybe they're trying to fundraise or something like that. I'm not sure what's going on, but... So yeah, that's Andre Karpathy, former Tesla AI chief and one of the founding engineers at OpenAI. And in this new interview, he basically tears down the current state of AI, calling it overhyped slop, but then goes on to explain what real intelligence will actually look like and why we might actually be losing control of it slowly. Let's get into it. All right, so one of the first things they talk about is the hype around AI agents. 2025 was supposed to be the year of agents, the year agents begun doing actual work. But Carpathy believes we are still a long ways away from that, and that we should actually be framing it as the decade of agents instead. Check this out. So the quote that you've just mentioned, it's the decade of agents, that's actually a reaction to an existing, pre-existing quote, I should say, where I think a lot of, the, some of the labs, I'm not actually sure who said this, but they were alluding to this being the year of agents mm. uh, with respect to LLMs and uh, how they were going to evolve. And I think um, I was triggered by that because I feel like there's <laughs> some over-predictions going on in the industry. Yeah. And uh, in my mind, this is really a lot more accurately described as the decade of agents. Yeah. And we have some very early agents that are actually like extremely impressive and that I use daily, uh, you know, Claude and Codex and so on. But I still feel like there's uh, so much work to be done. And so I think my like my reaction is like, we'll be working with these things for a decade. They're going to get better uh, and uh, it's going to be wonderful. But I think I was just reacting to the timelines, I suppose, of the, of the uh, implication. And what do you think will take a decade to accomplish? What are the yeah. bottlenecks? Well, um, actually make it work. So in my mm. mind, I mean, when you're talking about an agent, I guess, or what the labs have in mind and what maybe I have in mind as well, is it's, uh, you should think of it almost like an employee or like an intern that you would yeah. hire to work with you. Uh, so for example, you work with some employees here. Yeah. Um, when would you prefer to have an agent like Claude or Codex uh, do that work? Like yeah. currently, of course, they can't. Uh, what would it take for them to be able to do that? Uh, wh right. Why don't you do it today? Yeah. And the reason you don't do it today is because they just don't work. So right. uh, like they don't have enough intelligence. They're not multimodal enough. They can't do computer use and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they don't do a lot of the things that you've alluded to earlier. You know, they don't have continual learning. You can't just tell them something and they'll remember it. Yeah. And they're just cognitively lacking and it's just not working. And I just think that it will take about a decade to work through all of those issues. Interesting. So a decade definitely sounds like a long time, especially with how fast AI has been progressing in other areas, like, say, video generation. But like he said, agents aren't just tools. They're supposed to be more like good coworkers, ones that actually understand what to do, are reliable, and just work. And right now, they just don't. Carpathy says coding models have some of these same issues too, even though he uses them regularly. One of the biggest problems is that they're not good at writing or debugging code they've never seen before. In other words, they still can't really generalize. And this is when he calls it overhyped slop. Take a look. It's it's tough. I think they kind of know, they kind of know, but they don't fully know. And they don't know how to fully integrate it into mm -hmm. the repo and your style and your code and your place and some of the custom things that you're doing. Yeah. In, and uh, how it fits with all the assumptions of the repository and all this kind of stuff. So I think they do have some knowledge, but... Um, they haven't gotten to the place where they can actually integrate it, make sense of it, uh, and so on. I do think that a lot of this stuff, by the way, continues to improve. So um, I think currently probably state-of-the-art model that I go to is the GPT-5 Pro. Mm. Um, and uh, that's a very, very powerful model. So if I actually have 20 minutes, I will copy-paste my entire repo and I go to GPT-5 Pro, the Oracle, for like some questions. And yeah. often it's not too bad and surprisingly good compared to what existed a year ago. Yeah. Um, but I do think that uh, overall the models are... are um, they're not there. And I kind of feel like the industry, it's it's um it's over, it's it's making too big of a jump. Mm. And it's trying to pretend like this is amazing and it's not, it's slop. And I think they're not coming to terms with it. And maybe they're trying to fundraise or something like that. I'm not sure what's going on, but it's it, we're at this intermediate stage. The models are amazing, they still need a lot of work. For now, autocomplete is my sweet spot. <laughs> mm -hmm. But sometimes for some types of code, I will go to an LM agent. So he's being brutally honest here something we don't often see in the AI space. But he doesn't just stop at calling it slop. He actually explains why current models are stuck like this and what needs to change. According to Carpathy, the problem isn't that models aren't big enough, it's that they're too focused on memorizing everything instead of actually just thinking. 
He calls the solution a cognitive core, basically a smaller, smarter model that learns to think, not just recall. Here's how he explains it. Really interesting in the history of the field because at one point, everything was very um, scaling-pilled in yeah. terms of like, oh, we're going to make much bigger models, trillions of parameter models. Yeah. And actually what the models have done in size is they've gone up and now they've actually kind of like actually even come down. Yeah. State of their models are smaller. And even then, I actually think they memorized way too much. Um, so I think I had a prediction a while back that I almost feel like we can get cognitive cores that are very good at even like a billion, billion parameters. It, it should be already like, like if you talk to a billion parameter model, I think in 20 years, you can actually have a very productive conversation. It thinks, um, and it's a lot more like a human. Uh, but if you ask it some factual question, you might have to look it up. But it knows that it doesn't know, and it might have to look it up, and it will just do all the reasonable things. That, that's actually surprising that you think it will take a billion, because already we have a billion parameter models, or a couple billion parameter yeah. models that are like very intelligent. Well, some of our models are like a trillion parameters, right? But that's they right. remember so much stuff. Like, it's just Yeah, but it, I'm surprised that in 10 years, given the pace, okay, we have... GPT OSS 20B, that's way better than GPT-4 original, which was a trillion plus yeah. uh, parameters. So given that trend, I'm actually surprised you think in 10 years, the cognitive core is still a billion parameters. I would, uh, yeah, I'm surprised you're you not like, it's going to be like uh, tens of millions or millions. No, because I basically think that the training data is, so here's the issue. The training data is the internet, which yeah. is really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a huge amount of gains to be made because the internet is terrible. Yeah. Like if you actually, and even the internet, when you and I think of the internet, you're thinking of like, oh, Wall Street Journal, or yeah. that's not what this is. <laughs> when you're actually looking at a pre-training data set in the Frontier Lab, and you look at a random internet document, it's total garbage. Like, I don't even know how this works at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's some like st stock ticker symbols, yeah. uh, it's a huge amount of slop and garbage from like all the corners of the internet. It's not like your Wall Street Journal article that's extremely rare. Um, so I almost feel like because the internet is so terrible, we actually have to sort of almost like build really big models to compress all that. Uh, most of that compression is memory work instead of like cognitive work. Interesting. But what we really want is the cognitive part actually delete the memory. Right. And then, so, so I, I guess what I'm saying is like we need intelligent models to help us refine even the pre-training mm. set to just narrow it down to the cognitive components. And then I think you get away with a much smaller model because it's a much better data set and you could train it on it. But probably it's not trained directly on it. It's probably distilled from a much better model right. still. But So I really like this vision. What he's describing truly sounds like an AGI to me. A model that doesn't just know everything, but that is smart enough to figure anything out in any given situation. That seems way more powerful and far away from what we have now, and even the direction we're potentially heading in. I mean, like he said, the industry is still completely scale-pilled. Everyone's chasing bigger models, bigger data, bigger compute. And that's why we're seeing trillions of dollars being poured into AI infrastructure right now. Obviously, a lot of that comes from the insane demand. But it also shows just how deep that mindset still runs. I mean, it's the whole bitter lesson. Just scale up. But at the end of the day, Carpathy still thinks this is only maybe 10 to 20 years away. Compared to the wild predictions we're used to hearing, that might sound far. But 10 to 20 years for AGI is really nothing. And this is where the interview takes a bit of a dark turn. The host, Dorkesh, brings up super intelligence and asks Carpathy how he thinks about it. Here's what he had to say. How do you think about super intelligence? Do you expect it to feel qualitatively different from normal humans or human companies? I guess I think I see it as like a progression of automation in society, mm -hmm. right? And again, like extrapolating the trend of computing, I just I feel like there will be a gradual automation of a lot of things, and superintelligence will be sort of like the extrapolation of that. Uh, so I do think we expect more and more autonomous entities over time that are doing a lot of the digital work, and then eventually even the physical work, uh, probably some amount of time later. But the, basically, I see it as just uh, automation, mm. um, roughly speaking. I guess automation includes the things humans can already do, and superintelligence supplies things humans. Well, but some of the things that people do is invent new things, which I would just put into the automation, if that makes sense. Yeah. But you, I, I, I guess maybe um, less abstractly and more sort of like qualitatively. Mm. Do you expect something to feel like, okay, this because this thing can either think so fast or has so many copies, or the copies can merge back in them themselves, or is quote-unquote much smarter, mm -hmm. any number of advantages an yeah. AI might have. 
it will right. qualitative the, the civilization in which these AIs exist will yeah. just feel qualitatively different from human no, civilization. I think it, will, I mean, it, it is fundamentally automation, but I mean, it will be like extremely foreign. I do, I do think mm. it will look really strange because, um, like you mentioned, we can run all of this on a computer cluster, et cetera, and much faster and all this thing. Yeah. I mean, maybe some of the scenarios, for example, that uh, I start to get like nervous about mm. um, with, respect, with respect to when the world looks like that is this kind of like gradual loss of control and understanding yeah. of what's happening. And I, I think that's actually the most likely outcome probably mm. is that there will be a gradual loss of understanding of, uh, and we'll, we'll gradually layer all this stuff everywhere and there'll be fewer and fewer people who understand it. And then there will be a sort of this like scenario of a gradual loss of control and understanding of what's happening. That to me seems most likely outcome of mm. how all of this stuff will go down. So yeah, he thinks gradual loss of control and understanding is the most likely scenario. That sounds terrifying. I mean, it's one thing to have some massive event, but to slowly lose control without even realizing it, that's way worse, in my opinion. Because typically those massive events, like a 9-11 for example, create urgency. They force a response. But if we never have that kind of moment with AI, and it just quietly spreads into every corner of the earth, getting more powerful year after year, then who actually notices when we cross the line? It's possible we already have. That's what makes Carpathy's view so unsettling. It's not about apocalypse, it's about drift. About slowly giving up control while thinking we're the ones in charge. I think that's really what scares me the most about this whole AI thing. But anyway, that's all for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed the breakdown. If you did, feel free to drop a like, hit that subscribe button, and let me know what you thought down below. And as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.